Hey everybody, happy Tuesday morning. It is a bit grim, but good because we have some rain, nice, soft, long-standing rain, and we're gonna be, you know, taking advantage of this while we can get it. So welcome, welcome. Today I am going to be talking about capitalization. And is it legal? What exactly is it? And um, why people do it and if they do it legally or not. So first of all, let's talk about the grapevine themselves. Okay, so grapevines are deciduous plants, uh, which is a very technical way of saying that during the cooler months, they lose their leaves. Okay, so pretty much most of the plants that you're looking around at your cell, you know, as you walk around, you're gonna see that they start to fall during the cooler winter months. That means that they are deciduous. Pretty much only like our Christmas trees, the, those things that are called evergreens, okay? They don't lose their uh, pines. And the reason why this happens is a lot of scientific stuff, and that's why pine needles are really, really thin where the other leaves are bigger, right? Much more dangerous for a tree to leave its leaves on if it's the bigger trees, like in a grapevine. So the grapevines, the life cycle consists of seven stages. And these seven stages allow them to survive the system and continue to generate that fruit vintage after vintage after vintage, right? We can have grapevines that are 100 years old, right? And this is their life cycle. And no one stage of that life cycle is any more important or any less important than the other ones. They kind of rely on each other. So we start off with bud burst. Then we have flower and cluster initiation. Then we actually have the flowering, okay, which is really actually kind of cool at a vineyard. They're not massive flowers that you see on other plants. So, um, hi, Larry, great day. Um, so it's not like massive flowers that we see on other plants that are like, oh, how beautiful. But when you walk through the vineyard during the flowering stage, you can actually smell it. So it's kind of pretty cool. And then we have fruit set and berry development as the berries start to get bigger. And then of course we harvest it. And then right now they are going through dormancy. So they need a little rest after doing all of that work for us to give us our wine, they need a little rest. So during berry development, the grape begins to rapidly increase in size, right? So in around 15 days prior to verasion, so before that color starts to change, the seeds have kind of reached their final size and their weight. So there's, the seeds are extremely important to the grapevine because this is the way that it is going to continue its propagation, right? The seeds are how the next generation is going to come alive. So sugars are carried from the vine into the grape to make sure that the seed has enough energy to live, right? We don't wanna, the grapevines don't wanna produce these clusters and then have them die off. So sugar in the form of glucose and fructose are stored in the flesh. So this is how the seed can get the, the energy it needs. And then in a little lesser of an extent in the skin itself. So these sugars accumulate um, after verasion and then as the berry starts to you know, decrease its consumption because it's getting to that point, this is where we start to think about harvesting. So the total sugar in a fully ripened grape variety is significantly varies, okay? So it is depending on the environment. It depends on viticulture. It depends on, you know, how the, the weather, how the winemaker is tending to that vineyard, okay? And warmer climates allow the grapes to mature fully and more easily. And sugars in warmer climates tend to be higher thereby leading to higher levels of alcohol in the end product. But in cooler climates, the, sugars, the sugar content is so much less because the ripening is less. That's why going back to the Cab Franc, in the cooler climates, you tend to have that green pepper, right? Those pyrazines that we talked about previously in them because that fruit hasn't fully ripened to get rid of that, that greenness that's in there. So since it can be difficult in these cooler climates, right, we have a higher acidity, lower alcohol, 
but maybe not enough alcohol. Maybe there's not enough sugar in that grape in order to make the wine be um, have sugar. Um, so we have the sugar levels here, okay? So in these cooler regions, right, where the sugars may not reach the acceptable levels, if nothing is done, well, the wine is just gonna have really, really low alcohol. And yes, there's people who enjoy low alcohol wines, but like we don't want a 4% or a 6% wine, okay? So that also is going to have some issues with the body content, you know, how that wine feels on your mouth, okay? So in some cases, winemakers may add sugar to the grape juice and this must be done during the fermentation process so that the yeast have the sugars in order to continue to consume and then give us more alcohol. So this will result in an increase in the finished product's alcohol content, but it is also going to add to the body, to the mouthfeel of the wine. And this, adding the sugar back to the grape juice during fermentation, that is what chapitalization is. Now, chapitalization is a hugely regulated winemaking process, and it is forbidden in many, many regions. And where it is acceptable, it has strict regulations on how it can be done, okay? So <clears throat> it is legal only in the regions that produce grapes with that low sugar content. So we have regions such as Northern France, Germany, and there actually are parts of the United States where chapitalization is allowed. Now, there's also other parts that it's not. So it is not legal in Argentina. It is not legal in Australia. California, you cannot add sugar to the wine. Italy, Portugal, Spain, Africa, these are all regions where it is illegal to add that sugar. Okay, so the key fact to keep in mind about chapitalization is that the addition of sugar is not meant to make the wine sweet. We're not, people who are adding the sugar in these cooler regions are not trying to make a sweet wine. They're trying to make a dry wine that has enough alcohol to give it that correct body, to give it that correct mouthfeel during, uh, right? So we need more sugar in there for the yeast to go through alcohol fermentation, right? Sweet wine is made in a different process. Sweet wine, they want the wine, they wanna stop the alcoholic fermentation from occurring so that there is residual sugar in the wine. Chapitalization, they're not looking for residual sugar, okay? So why is it called chapitalization? Well, we have this guy here. Uh, let me find him. Okay, so we have this guy here um, and he created the concept. So the first recorded instance of adding sugar to a wine dates back to 1765. So this has been going on for quite some time. And the first time it was talked about was in the encyclopedia, which suggested that adding sugar uh, rather than lead acetate, yes, they used to add lead acetate. Good thing we changed that, okay? Um, that that was what they used to add to get this wine up to the proper alcohol levels. But it wasn't until the really the early 1800s that this gentleman here, Jean Antoine Claude Chapdel, began truly using the process to increase alcohol and help allowing wine to age longer. So you do something like that, you make it popular, you explain to people how this helps their product, how this helps sell their wine, they're gonna name the process after you. So Jean-Antoine Claude Chapdel, he is the person who really put forth the concept of adding sugar into the fermentation process to allow these cooler regions to reach higher alcohol levels. And that is why we call it chapitalization. So I hope you uh, enjoyed this conversation. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. Also, if you have something that you would like me to talk about in a future Get Live with Dracina Wines, just let me know. And this will also be up on the YouTube channel, so head on over there and check that out soon, okay? Have a great week. Sláinte.